so just for clarification, I'm kind of, I guess I'm representing Doug Engelbart Institute here because I'm sharing some of what he did and then I have my own ideas too. So um, in terms of his leadership, uh, it, had, it was sort of twofold. One of them was that uh, in the early days as a pioneer, um, he was funded by Bob Taylor at ARPA, one of the Hall of Famers, um, to, uh, to do research on sort of collective uh, tools for collective thought and collective knowledge, advancing our collective knowledge and how people can work together on problem solving. And this was at a time when computers were thought to be uh, for number crunching and punch cards. So it was very, you know, advanced kind of thing. It was sort of the first system to really put together um, how, you, how you use it for knowledge as opposed to, you know, math or science or whatever. Um, so he was, so, so in that project, he was pioneering hypermedia, collaborative technologies, video teleconferencing. Um, he invented the computer mouse and other kinds of user interface stuff. So it sort of laid the foundation for digital libraries, uh, online communities. So laying the foundation for what became personal computing, um, collaborative technologies, uh, you know, hypermedia and knowledge management, all that kind of thing. Uh, he really laid the groundwork for that. So, so, so uh, the short answer uh, for that part is that you know he was sort of pioneering the stuff that added value to the eventual internet. The second part, though, that he had a direct role in the very you know the ground floor of the ARPANET, which was the precursor to the internet. And because he was funded by ARPA under Bob Taylor, Bob Taylor was the one who put together a plan for doing an ARPANET and connecting all the computer labs that he was uh, funding. And so he pulled together his principal investigators um, to, you know, tell them here's what we're planning to do, connect all your computers. And, and Doug Engelbar, my dad, was the first one to sort of step forward and, and, you know, step in line and say, you know, sign me up because that's right in line with my research and allows, you know, allowed him to extend the collaborative technology aspect of it and, and have a greater reach for the users of this, you know, new technology. Um, he was also given the task of, um, because of his orientation for knowledge management and online community um, and online uh, digital library type of stuff to, um, to uh, set up and run a network information center that would help connect the ARPANET community. And so um, because of that, he was then going to be the second host up on the, on the network. And so UCLA uh, was the first one up. They got that working. And then they connected my dad's lab uh, at SRI in Menlo Park. And um, they made the first transmission over the ARPANET. So that's kind of a key a key role and then you know ran the network information center and um, and that eventually took a life of its own with Jake Feinler and all of that. So uh, so this again is my father uh, and his work because I didn't enter the picture until 1978. Um, so I guess the first key moment was all the collaborative technology, hypermedia, the computer mouse, all that kind of stuff that was um, by 1967 pretty much in full operation in his lab. Uh, in 1968, they sta his lab staged a demonstration um, at a conference of the technology and what you could do with it. And that became known as the mother of all demos. So that was 1968, mother of all demos. It was sort of a key moment in history. Um, then. You know, the second, another one would be that he was the second host. His lab was the second host uh, hooked into the ARPANET. So that was, you know, pretty momentous to say. As he used to say, um, it's not a network until you add the second host because the first host is just <laughs> all by itself. So, so putting his lab on, actually, then it became the ARPANET. Um, I think there's a third thing that... Um, that isn't highlighted very much, but um, it it meant a lot in his work and and what the future of um, 
you know, online communities and that kind of thing is that once he, the, once the ARPANET was up and running, then he was able to offer his tools onto, uh, on the ARPANET to um, other organizations that might want to start taking advantage of that kind of thing. And so he got together a, a sort of early user community and they all connected online. And that was probably, that was the early 1970s. So it's probably the very first online user community uh, and sort of customer driven design and innovation. I think you'd say partly cloudy, um, and I have that same, I share that opinion. Um, I think that there's so much potential for the internet and already so much that has happened that has you know, connected us worldwide and uh, advanced our, our sort of collective knowledge on so many different topics and areas and you know, the potential for having an informed public and um, you know, that's all so valuable. Um, the, and where it really works is how it was intended to work as an open platform. It's an open internet and it's, you know, to promote, um, it, you know, to, for, for universal access. And so that is what makes it so powerful. If, as, you know, if, if people are excluded or, or it's not open or, you know, too much control is put on it, then it's not. Um, when citizens' rights are, are um, protected on the internet, you know, then, then it's a powerful tool. Um, on the other hand, there is so much potential for disaster, I guess, because, um, you know, when you have instances of not having an open internet, there's not uh, accessibility, and so, um, so there's too much control, there's, there's much, the, the value of the internet is way diminished, and um, you, don't, you don't have an informed public, and you don't have an ability to really connect around the ideas that are important to society. Um, when you have an informed public, then you can really advance society. And when you have a misinformed public, uh, that, you know, it's a, it could be a recipe for disaster. Um, and that one of the cloudy parts of the internet is how much misinformation is proliferating out there and taking on a life of its own. Some of it is just, you know, sort of unintentional of people just blah, blah, blah on the internet, but some of it is intentional and um, that can become very insidious and undermine society. Um, so I think those are, those are the key things. I think my biggest concern is that um, it sort of bogs down into, uh, you know, a consumer, just a sort of consumer um, delivery mechanism. And uh, there's, there's so much sort of passive use of the internet of going and finding things that are published and find it, which is, you know, it's great to have that as a resource. But um, I think the real hope is that we can, I think Tim Berners-Lee said this as well, that instead of using it for TV, we should be, you know, just TV, we should also be using it for knowledge. That's where the, the greatest potential for mankind, I believe, is in um, using the tools and fashioning the kinds of tools that we really need for, um, for advancing our knowledge and our ability to solve problems together and um, you know, make a better world. And so we've really only scratched the surface of that. And so, uh, you know, after all of these years, how many years have we had networking and, you know, and, and the internet that we still have only just scratched the surface of the greatest potential on the planet, which is our collective intelligence, our collective minds. So, I, one of the reasons that's happened is because it's not a money maker. You know, what's on there now for the most part is market driven tools that, oh, here's a nifty idea, you know, that we can make money on uh, and people are buying it and all that kind of thing. But I think this is where the government, uh, governments really need to step in and, and put resources and, you know, 
uh, on the order of a grand challenge, really. And that's, that's where the, the real potential of the internet will, uh, will benefit humanity in the most profound ways. I think to start with, um, my father actually identified over the years based on his uh, prolific work and experience, and you know we worked on refining this together, uh, a, a bucket list of sort of key paradigm issues in how the tools are designed that we have now and how that needs to change in order to really support the kind of collective um, knowledge work that that will benefit mankind so much so um, so some of the key things if we just picked a few action items I think one of the most powerful things is to stop thinking of it uh, of the tools you know in terms of the tools that we use for knowledge uh, creation and and you know sort of information technology um, we have all these documents online um, and they're they're not that much further advanced than stone tablets in some ways. I mean, you, you can jump there, you know, it's up on your screen and you can scroll, um, but, you know, just like a stone tablet, you can't collapse it and look at just the headings. Well, you know, we're online. We are in a whole new medium. It's not a stone tablet. It's not, a, you know, a scroll anymore. What, you know, the tools need to be able to... Um, to do a lot more. And so um, I think we need to get away from that paradigm of, you know, sort of the paper paradigm, the book paradigm, the publishing paradigm, and say, well, there's knowledge in there and it's trapped in there until you can, you know, access it from any vantage point in any, you know, level of detail that you need to. So um, the, the potential there that's been missing is, uh, to think of it more as knowledge on a page, knowledge on a book, instead of what is the knowledge in your mind and how are you trying to share that and develop that. And so, you know, for, for thousands of years it was trapped in different media and now we're online. And so, you know, when, if you think of it this way, when you're thinking, your mind works at lightning speed. I mean, literally, you can just bomb around in your mind and just think all kinds of, it's just so fast. Anytime you need to try to communicate it, whether it's speaking or writing or anything like that, you have to slow way down. There's no way you can write or speak as fast as you're thinking. And, um, and so, you know, why are we limiting ourselves still to just language? Uh, we could have, you know, let's look at, at some whole new ways of capturing what's in our mind and supporting how we think instead of having us have to slow down to you know put it into language or put it on a page and you know and then we want to look at something else and go find another page and sort of scroll through it or search through it you know why can't I just I want to see what the headings are I want to so that's one of the first things to do is to think you know, in terms of design, to think of these knowledge um, media as more like the mind that you can bomb around and collapse and all that kind of stuff. And um, so one of them is, I mean, one of the very simple things, should be technologically very simple, is to, you know, everywhere you go to look at knowledge is to be able to just collapse your view and just look at the headings. I mean, that would be so powerful. And it would be, if you could do that anywhere, that would just be so powerful. It would just, I think it would just elevate, instantly elevate our um, efficiency and effectiveness and, and the speed at which we can, you know, think and find things and make associations and all the things that our minds want to do. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's one thing. And then another thing is, um, you know, everything, the, you know, the addressability of things or the internet of things, everything has an address on the internet. So you can, so you can specifically link to anything on the internet. Well, um, that, you know, in, in the document world, that can take you to a document, but it can't take you inside the document unless the author put a provision in there called an anchor. And so you're kind of stuck with just going to the top of it and then looking for the information that you want. Um, 
it's, this actually is not true, though, um, in, uh, in spreadsheets, is that from the beginning, spreadsheets offered every piece of information inside a spreadsheet is uniquely identifiable and addressable. So you can say, you know, it's, it's in cell number A5. You know, you go right to it. So you can link right into any specific part of a file. We need to be able to do that in all of our knowledge. We need to be able to link directly into any specific place that we want to. If I'm browsing something, reading something, I go, oh, wow, I need my colleague to see this. I should be able to just click right there, create a link, and send it to them. And that takes them right there. So that would be so powerful, and we can't do it. So finally, though, we can do it in um, YouTube is offering it actually on videos that you can create a link to a specific frame. And that's really powerful. You know, oh, wow, I need somebody to see this section of this video. Just boom, they can go right there. And that is so important. And it's taken so long to have, you know, the provisions are already in there. The hooks are already in there. So technologically, it's very simple. And it's, it's more of a political, I don't know what it is. It's a human thing of why we haven't done it and what would be hard about actually implementing it. But I, would, I think those would be sort of the, the key things that I would say would give us huge power and get us started in the right direction. But one other thing is, um, is take another look at this whole thing about apps. Because when you're looking at knowledge and working on knowledge, is that you're not, it's not about Am I using Microsoft Word? Am I using PowerPoint? Am I using you know, Google Docs or whatever? It's about, here's my information that I'm working on. I'm just working on this, and I need certain tools. So do I have it in um, you know, Evernote? Do I have it in, you know, where is it? And you know, <laughs> this document's in here, and this document's. And it's just crazy. It's like I'm using this document, and I need tools to work on it. And so I should be able to pick whatever tools I want to work on it in the given moment and not have it attached to one application. That's crazy. That is such, it's a productivity drain in our system. And especially now that there's so much variety you know, that's offered. You're using this system, I'm using that system. We get on and it's like, OK, well, this is here and this is, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's like, this is the information. It's all about, it's knowledge centric. It's not application-centric, and that's what we really need to be thinking in that direction. <laughs>